Greetings from Elite English Academy. Dear friends, in this video, I am going to discuss how to prepare for Unit 1, in which, as part of it, I am going to discuss 2019 question paper of TRB PG English. This is the 2019 unit wise question distribution of TRB PG English exam. So the first unit, Modern Literature, the first part, it contains three genres, Poetry, Prose, Drama. As usual, it has got uh, detailed and non-detailed works. In Poetry, the detailed works are Prologue to the Canterbury Tales and Fairy Queen Book 1. From each, one, questions, one question has come. Then second, non-detailed, from Prothalamian, no question. From Epithalamian, there is a deeper question. Then uh, from uh, Peacock Volume Collection, Thomas White, from that uh, one question is asked. From Surrey, there is no question. Then from uh, Peacock Volume 2, Ballads, there are 39 ballads, so out of which uh, two questions are asked. Regarding the prose, from Bacon's essays, one question is asked. From Apology for Poetry, one question. From the non-detail, the book of Job, there is one chapter from the Holy Bible, Old Testament, from which uh, one question is asked. Then from drama, from Dr. Faustus, one question, that is the detailed work. From the non-detail, from alchemist, there is one more question. From Spanish tragedy, there is no representation. Interestingly, one more uh, question was there that was common because the, that is the collection of different works. Who is the father of criticism, father of poetry, father of prose, like that. So for that one question. But so strictly the unitization is followed. If you closely analyze from detailed work, only five questions. The one more question that is the common question, right? Then from non-detail, six questions are asked. So from this we understand that there is no distinction between detailed works and non-detailed work. So it is very important in all the videos. I have been suggesting that you go for the detailed analysis of works, whether it is under the category of detailed or non-detailed work. Now let's move to the questions asked. This is the first question asked. So it is a very deeper question. One textual line is given. To boil the chicken and the marrow bones and powder, march and tart and galingale, he could roast and save and boil and fry, makes mortuous and well bake a pie. The question is from the textual line, the question is very deep. It's asked. Poetry Merchant Tart. In the lines given above from the Canterbury Tales seem to have right. So there are more than 800 lines in Canterbury Tales. That is a prologue to Canterbury Tales. So this particular part is about the cook. So when you have gone through the textual lines, it is just like that you can answer. For example, the cook is good at cooking chicken certain dishes related to chicken then what could have been poured look at the lines again powder march and tart tart is a kind of uh, a substance that is added so look at the options root of sweet uh, cypress that is a distant option strong seasoning it is irrelevant totally irrelevant so you have to choose between soup and medieval curry powder see Soup is a kind of dish, right? See, look at that. And powder, merchant, and galingen. Galingen. So these are the things for preparing chicken related dishes. He is using some substance. So soup is a dish. But whereas uh, what is given the target uh, phrase powder is, it is something that is added. So based on this logic, you have to go for the answer. So it is medieval curry powder. The second question. Therewith she spewed out of her filthy maw a flood of poison, horrible and black, 
full of great lumps of flesh and gobbled straw. Spencer in the lines from Fairy Queen, given about describes the resistance of right. So even you need not go for the textual lines. If you become familiar with or if you are familiar with the plot line, you can easily answer this question. Look at the first two lines very closely. There with she, so it is referred as she, right? She spewed out of her filthy maw, that is mouth, a flood of poison, horrible and black. From somebody's mouth, a flood of poison and horrible and black comes. So from whose mouth, something like fire, something like uh, black, something like poison would come. So now come to the options. The loathly frogs, lazy frogs, right? The wicked enchantress, the evil dragon, the red cross knight. So here the red cross knight is the person who is helping the protagonist Una. So option D is removed. Now we have three. The loathly frogs. Frogs are normally here not referred by the pronoun she. So that also can be removed. So look at that. The wicked enchantress, the evil dragon. These are the two options we have. So the wicked enchantress, she is coming in the disguise of a beautiful woman very often in the book. As a result, she cannot have this kind of this kind of poison, horrible and black thing that comes out of her mouth. So though she is an enchantress, though she is doing black magic, she is not displaying all these things and in public. So the thing is, the remaining answer, the option is the evil dragon. So normally we know the dragons, they have the power of just uh, spitting out fire, this and that. So Una's parents are just imprisoned in one way and the castle is being uh, just uh, the dragon is waiting for their death, right? Una goes in search of uh, different people to help her kill the dragon. So for that only the Red Cross Knight has come. So very beautifully the options are given because the Red Cross Knight, so he is a distant uh, option so that we remove. Frogs also we remove, somehow that does not come closer to the answer. The wicked enchantress, the people who know the wicked enchantress does not display her evil things at public very easily that those persons can understand the answer could be the evil dragon. So this particular part comes in Canto 11. There are 12 cantos in book 1 towards the end of Canto 11, this particular, when there is a fight between the Red Cross Knight and the evil dragon. So when uh, the Red Cross Knight, uh, he takes upper hand, at that time the evil dragon resists. Now we are moving to the next one. Which one of the following characters does the expression, the insidious kill joy puritan match? So it is uh, option D. Aeneas, actually, if you go through the text very easily, you can understand it is from Alchemist. From Alchemist, this is the character, Aeneas is the character who has the insider's killjoy puritan match. He uses that uh, expression, he is described by that expression. Next, be a physician fastest, keep up gold and be eternized for some wondrous cure. In the lines given above, Faustus is thinking of the profit to be gained like Chaucer's dash in the Canterbury Tales. Actually, a hats off to the person who said the question, because this is the question that demands the understanding of two different works. One is Dr. Faustus, another one is the Canterbury Tales. In Canterbury Tales, especially in the prologue, all the characters nature are described. So the miller, monk, the wife of Bath, uh, doctor of uh, physic, all these things. So here miller is the person who is uh, running some business in the countryside. Right? He owns corn mill. So he is not interested in keeping the gold. Right? Second one monk. Monk wears ornaments but he is not uh, projected as 
a person who is much interested in gold. Of course, he also has gold. The wife of Bath. So the character of wife of Bath is described. She has many husbands, this and that. Then the doctor of physic. So the doctor, the doctor is known for two reasons. So he is a person who gets gold for his work. He is the person who got more money during the plague. So when you are familiar with the textual line of prologue to the Canterbury Tales, this question can be answered very easily. See, Faustus. He Faustus is instructed by Satan to amaze, uh, just uh, increase gold, get more uh, gold. It is a kind of alluring thing. So the quality of that greediness it has been compared to one of the characters from Canterbury Tales. So the answer is Doctor of Physic. So very simple. So if you know the important characteristics of all the characters of Prologue to Canterbury Tales. This question can be easily attended. Actually, this is the textual line. So, if it comes in uh, 444th line. The sentence uh, goes like this. Since in medicine, gold is a restorative for the heart. Therefore, he loved gold in particular. So, it is about the doctor, physician. So, the answer is the physician. Next one. Spencer's Epithalamian is a wedding song in the long tradition of Epithalamia and is written in an English adaptation of the irregular stance of the Italian. So this is the most difficult question asked in this particular unit. Because normally, so what is the rhyme scheme this and that that are uh, given? So based on the answer key provided, I had to refer to different uh, sources to get uh, whether it is right or wrong. So the option given out of the four, it is a very factual question, not all available in textbooks also. In some reference books, it is available. Can, can so, so that is the option. Let me give you the source from which I got this answer. So there is a book in which the Cambridge years and after the development of Spencer is discussed in which towards the end, look at the last few lines, just as all the Petrarchan sonnets and conson from and other Italian, French and Latin marriage words evident in the Epithalamian and the Amorati sonnets. So what we have to understand here, he follows the pattern of the Italian influence of conson in Epithalamian and Amorati Sonus. These are the two uh, works published together. So this is the work. So normally this information is not available in many of the sources. Just uh, probably later it may be asked in an option. Just uh, become familiar with that. And one more fact is at Cambridge only Spencer picked up Italian, French and past and other contemporary English literature. So it is in Cambridge University when he was there as a student, he learned so many things about the other languages. Sixth one. These be, they that, as the first and most noble sort may justly be termed weights. So these are weighted on in the excellent languages and best understandings. It is a textual line. Sydney describes, Philip Sydney describes the dash as weights in an apology for poetry. Of course, it is a 50 page work you should have gone through. So then now, what is the literal meaning of weights? Weights means in modern English, the nouns weights and overweight are used as technical terms for ancient Celtic bards. Bards means poets. Not only bards, prophets and philosophers. So please, uh, Note this, if you refer to the dictionary, weights means in uh, modern English, it refers to poets, prophets and philosophers. But in whose sense Sydney has used? Now based on this understanding, read the text again. These be they that as the first and most noble sort may justly be termed weights. So these are weighted on the 
excellent languages and best understandings who is known for the best language is it a philosopher is it a prophet or is it a poet see philosophers are known for their ideas prophets are known for their revelations whereas the poets are known for their excellent language so based on that we come to the understanding that weights means through weights philip sidney refers to the poets question number 7 this is also based on the textual line forget not it the great essays the cruel wrong the scornful ways the painful pains in the nays even the language itself is very difficult so so the given options are george gasoin earl of surrey sir thomas wet and edmund spencer so one thing is the first option we can remove because that person is not part of our syllabus so with some uh, blind understanding we just remove option a earl of surrey sir thomas wet so if you take other questions so the language of edmund spencer is understood right normally we can uh, though there are difficult words here and there the language will be good it can you can comprehend comprehend whereas this is very difficult as a result we can remove edmund spencer also one more thing from edmund spencer there are other questions so based on that understanding also we remove that so we have these two persons earl of surrey and sir thomas wait so the right option is sir thomas wait actually this particular line is from the poem forget not yet the tried intent forget not yet the tried intent from that work the particular lines are taken actually thomas wait and ann boylan they were in love it is believed so thomas wait's neighbor is ann boylan ann boylan was a beautiful woman it is believed that she also loved him but at the same time since she was beautiful since she was very intelligent she had the unique way of attracting men later she became the wife of henry the 8 so when it was known to thomas wait when thomas wait comes to know there is a marriage between anne boleyn and henry the 8 so this particular work poetry forget not yet the tried intent is written as a farewell song to anne boleyn so please make a note of it very specific information so since the lady love suppose lady love anne boleyn is going to marry the king henry the 8 the poet the depressed poet thomas wait has written this particular poem as a parting gift next how many sons did the widow in the ballad of the wife of pushers well have actually in this particular uh, work it comes under the work uh, ballads ballads authors are not known there are 39 ballads in peacock volume 2 there are 39 unauthored uh, ballads so this is the third ballad so then uh, the answer is 3 the woman has three children so look at the textual line there lived a wife of wife at usher's well and a wealthy wife was she she had three stout and stalwart sons so based on this textual line we have finalized three is the answer somewhere i saw it in the key it was mentioned some other number but three is the right answer now we are moving to the next question the ballad again from the ballad uh, another question is asked the ballad adam or garden is a terrible story of garden's attack on the castle of so like the previous question so in the previous question in the first paragraph the question was asked in this ballad in the second paragraph the question is uh, taken so it is the roads the sorry the roads is the answer now let's see the textual line 
so the poem begins uh, with it fell about uh, martimas like that and uh, we will go to the house of the roads to see that fair lady so based on this we have finalized this answer see what i have uh, seen uh, from uh, ballads the question nature of question they are not difficult but it is important you go through the text if you go through the text of these ballads so of course uh, whatever may be the question asked you can easily answer next in which part of the book of job does god show himself through the presentation of the panorama of his creation so the prologue no definitely no so normally god has the way of expressing himself in bible through different things through lightning through fire and through wind so here it is a true only whirlwind see look at this option c the debate between job and his three friends not possible through that god will not reveal uh, himself then speeches of elio so that is also not possible so god manifest himself to job through whirlwind so this is the textual uh, line so it is a part of bible so in book of job chapter 38 line 1 then the lord answered job out of the whirlwind so that is the answer 11 francis bacon quotes the following statement in his essay of friendship taken from aristotle's dash whosoever delighted in solitude is either a wild beast or a god so this is the line he quotes in the very first paragraph itself and he refers to aristotle also but he does not refer the name of the book from which he chose but later from the understanding only we have to unearth the answer so the poetics is all about poetry right the drama the scene that the athenian constitution it is about uh, the constitution of that country metaphysics it is irrelevant so we have to choose between b and a so most appropriate thing is the politics right so the politics is the answer 12 this is also one of the beautiful questions and also it is easy so when you study the introduction of or the background of all the given authors definitely one or two questions will be coming like this you can easily answer so chaucer you know chaucer is the father of english poetry spencer spencer is called as the poet's poet actually this is the distracting factor both chaucer and spencer are known poets then who is the father father it is uh, come we know it is uh, chaucer only then uh, the poet's poet who calls one more information please note down who first calls spencer as poet's poet it is charles lamb charles lamb for the per- first time refers spencer as poet's poet then the next two things sydney and bacon so between these two who is the father of english essays we know it is bacon so bacon is okay then uh, sydney the only option uh, left is the father of english criticism there is a trick actually if you refer to different books the father of english criticism is dryden who terms dryden called as father of english criticism dr johnson right whereas here sydney after the publication of the work apology for poetry the contemporaries call him as the father of criticism see if you refer to very good books you will go with the answer dryden but from the given options here there is no dryden if dryden is there definitely dryden is the father of english criticism but here once sydney so sydney's apology for poetry was published only after his death he died very young at the age of 31 or 32 so afterwards so the contemporary critics or contemporary writers they call him as just the father of english criticism at that time but it is not an established note dear friends 
so far i have discussed the question pattern and the old questions asked in 2019 pgtrb exam as discussed most of the answers are part of our course videos so if you wish to join us please call 6381458485 please subscribe to our channel for more free videos so we'll be going for the analysis of each and every unit thank you all the best